Frau Bundespräsidentin Doris Leuthardt. Presidenta de la Confederación, señora Doris Leuthardt. Government Excellencies, dear friends, members, partners and constituents of the World Economic Forum. It's the 40th time that I stand in front of you to welcome you cordially to the annual meeting of the World Economic Forum. I would like to express my gratitude to those members, all of you, who are so much engaged, so much committed to what we are doing. And I would like to honor particularly those who have accompanied us for many years and just to have an opportunity to thank you, I would like to ask those who have been more than 10 times here or 10 times to stand up for a moment and let's give them a big hand. I don't want to lose much time reflecting on the past and we will not have a special birthday celebration except at the end of this opening session we will have a short musical celebration given by Lang Lang on this very special occasion. Let me be very clear be very clear about the challenges ahead in 2010. It will be a challenging year. A challenging year. Some of you may think, or some of us may think, the worst is over and that we are back to business as usual. That's a dangerous way of thinking. The crisis has fundamentally changed our world and we cannot longer revert to the old system individually and collectively. We must all address the new reality and embrace the theme of our annual meeting 2010, improving the state of the world, rethinking, redesigning, rebuilding. Concretely, this means rethinking our values, redesigning our systems, and rebuilding our institutions. When we met 12 months ago, we were standing at the edge of an abyss. Thanks to the decisive and coordinated action, particularly of the G20, and here our opening speaker, of this evening played a particularly important role. Thanks to this action of government, a complete collapse of the world, financial and economic system was avoided. But let's not fool ourselves. We are right now still paying the price for the irrational and irresponsible behavior that it is existing long before the crisis hit and which already seems to be creeping back into the system. Governments have assumed massive debt to save the system from a total collapse. The same governments are forced to pay billions and there will be enormous pressure on public goods and services for years to come. This will ultimately lead to higher taxes, reduction in social and public health systems, as well as reduced investments in education and infrastructure. Let me express here a concern. Last year, governments were clearly in charge and truly committed to international cooperation. 
Today, we hope, we hope that governments don't become overwhelmed by internal issues and politics and constraints to the detriment of exercising the necessary global stewardship. Copenhagen is a warning example. We run the risk that 2010 becomes the year of the social crisis following the financial crisis of 2008 and the economic crisis of 2009. And this social crisis could easily become an intergenerational crisis if we continue the dangerous habit of delaying true problem solving to the detriment of our children and grandchildren. One of the top priorities of this annual meeting is to encourage entrepreneurship and job creation. Significant work must be done to rebuild a true trustful partnership between governments and business based on well-coordinated and smart regulation to allow business to be innovative, enterprising, and particularly job creating. The purpose of the World Economic Forum is not to make decisions, but to act as a force for reflection and connection, connecting ideas, proposals, stakeholders, countries, and culture, cultures. Rebuilding our global house is an absolute necessity. But there is much, something which is much more urgent. Our fellow human beings in Haiti desperately need our help to rebuild their destroyed country, to restore their lives. Haiti's devastation harshly underscores the common humanity that we share. We all want to unite in Davos to reconstruct Haiti and encourage long-term sustained economic growth. And tomorrow, President Clinton and I will launch a special initiative in this respect. Before I conclude, it is worthwhile to briefly reflect on the past 40 years. 40 years ago, I defined the stakeholder concept that forms the philosophical base of the World Economic Forum and led to its creation. The main idea is that leadership is meant to serve all stakeholders of a company and at a higher level serves the global community. Leaders must act as the trustees for the long-term prosperity of the community they are responsible for. We must revitalize this concept in the form of stakeholder capitalism in which the creative and entrepreneurial forces of capitalism are made to work in the interest of all stakeholders. And we must expand the concept to include true global citizenship where all stakeholders of our global community, which means all of you here in this hall, pursue not only your direct business, institutional or national interests, but work together to improve the state of the world. I have now the great honor and pleasure Frau Doris Leuter, of introducing Mrs. Doris Leuter, President of the Swiss Government and the Head of the Economic Affairs in Switzerland and of Finance. I would also like to Thank you at the same time, Mrs. Möglich, President, Federal President. This yearly meeting 
has again come to a pass thanks to the great support from the Swiss government and the Swiss people. And I would also like to thank Madame Bruder, who is the Vice Chairman of the National Council and the President, Madame Banini, of the State Council. Join my thanks to their support. And I would also like to thank all the cantonal representatives, Mr. Laudi, the President of the Parliament and the President of the Government of the Canton. And lastly, but certainly not least, I would like to thank our friends and hosts here in Davos, express a very special and warm thanks to them for all their work, in particular Hans-Peter Michel, who is the Mayor of Davos. Madam President of the Federal Government, may I invite you to convey the message of your government to the annual gathering. Thank you. Professor Schwab, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I warmly welcome you here to Switzerland, to Davos, for this year's annual meeting of the World Economic Forum. It is indeed a honor for Switzerland to be the host country for the WEF, which offers an excellent forum for world leaders in business and in politics to meet. And this, it is important to meet these days, because 15 months ago the world was staring into the abyss. But unlike during the crisis in the eight years ago, central banks and governments came together to tackle the crisis and avert financial and economic collapse. The crisis also set in motion a process of wide-ranging deliberations, how to reform the international financial system, what form a framework for sustainable and balanced growth would take, and how we can save as many jobs as possible. Never again should the world suffer such a financial meltdown. Using international financial and economic organizations such as the IMF, the Financial Stability Board, the WTO, the OECD and the ILO, a selection of world leaders swiftly put together an ambitious reform agenda. And today, there is broad consensus on many of the things that need to be done. It is commendable that the world, in response to this crisis, has been able to reach such fundamental agreement and that the world leaders have been heard loud and clear, calling for concerted action. However, I see a rift opening up between rhetoric and reality. First, in terms of financial reforms, the rhetoric is that more stringent capital and liquidity requirements are necessary, that compensation systems need to be integrated into financial institutions' risk management, so that risk-promoting bonus payments for both business success and failures are prevented. The reality is that many countries are doing very little in this area. Bankers are already trying to wriggle out of their responsibilities. In some countries, they are lobbying quite successfully against tougher capital and liquidity requirements, against more effective depositor protection, and they are planning to pay out their longest ever bonuses. On protectionism, the G20 leaders' rhetoric was to fight protectionism and remain committed to bringing the Doha round to a successful conclusion in 2010. The reality is, apart from some uh, progress in the Doha round, we are still waiting for the great breakthrough. The reality is also different on protectionism. The global trade alert tells us that between November 2008 and December 2009, G20 countries alone were responsible for 184 of global total 297 discriminatory trade measures. On the subject of exit strategies, we agree that 
Countries must prepare their exit from crisis mode. Most importantly, accumulated government debt needs to be addressed. World growth will only be able to return to healthy and sustainable levels if governments come up with workable plans as to how their fiscal deficits and debt can be reduced. So much for the rhetoric. The reality is that apart from hunting for allegedly large amounts of unpaid taxes abroad, at times using dubious means to do so, not much is genuinely being done. Large fiscal deficits and government debt persist with no firm strategy to address them. A shift from reality is now needed. Today, the world is witnessing a shift in influence and economic power. One upshot of this is that the G20, a new group, also includes emerging market countries, and that's a good thing. I believe with power and prosperity also comes responsibility. If emerging powers merit their place at the table due to their economic and financial success, they should accept these responsibilities by relinquishing developing country status, for example. We not only need a new financial architecture, but also a new political architecture. Global challenges such as climate change, the food crisis, or the Doha round need to be addressed head on. We need to stop this game of Mikado, where the first one to get anything moving loses. We must all sit down together in a responsible manner, bring our part of the solution to the table and allow a conclusion to be reached that benefits us all. As far as financial regulatory reform is concerned, we are hurtling towards the abyss like Corey Allen and James Dean in Rebel Without the Cause, who gets out of the car or breaks first loses. It is now time to stop this game of chicken or roar into the next crisis. Both political and business leaders are called on to leave the champagne on ice for the time being, live up to their responsibilities and contribute to policies that are more conducive to sustainable and balanced growth. We cannot go back to practices before the crisis. That would be going forward into the past. All members of the international community must assume their responsibilities. If the world economy is to move towards sustainable and balanced growth, policies must address government and household debt. Exchange rate policies must also be adapted in certain countries to allow the correction of macroeconomic imbalances. The time of this year's annual meeting here in Davos is rethink, redesign, rebuild. We must rethink, redesign and rebuild a sustainable and balanced global economy. In dealing with natural disasters, the world is capable of keeping the divide between rhetoric and reality in check. This has been demonstrated in recent weeks by the international response to the earthquake in Haiti. However, as far as economic and political crises are concerned, the world has yet to pass to this test. Rhetoric and reality all too often diverge by large margins. In times of crisis, is a statement's heart closer to his taxpayers is a manager more concerned about his own gain than the greater good? The number of protectionist reactions and recurring discussions about lavish bonus payments give me cause to wonder. Clearly, we find it more difficult to close the gap between rhetoric and reality to follow up collective discourse with collective action. But for all that, history has given us plenty of examples 
We have sufficient historical experience, the necessary know-how is at our disposal, and we also have the instruments it takes. So, what are we waiting for? The century began with a terrible financial and economic crisis. People need jobs and a salary. We have talked enough. It is now time to get moving. Hope that Davos may encourage us all. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. President, Madam President. Maintenant, je suis heureux I'm very happy et très honoré and also very honored que le président de la République française to say that the president of the Nicolas French Republic, Sarkozy, Mr. Nicolas Sarkozy, soit avec nous ce soir. is with us this evening. And on behalf of all the participants to here today, I would like to welcome him in Davos. There are three reasons amongst others that make your presence here on the occasion of Je our annual gathering so very appreciated. No other head of state embodies so well, both in his action, political action and convictions, the theme that we'll be discussing here in the days to come here at Davos, the subject which is how to modernize without at the same time losing our values, the structures and institutions at the national and international level in order to make them fit in with modern times. I would also like to thank President Sarkozy for the action he took during the financial crisis. The head of the French state at that time proved also on other occasions that he is very brave, very determined, and very creative, uncommonly so. For me, it is also a very personal satisfaction to be able to greet here today the president of the French state. I have lived in Geneva for more than 40 years, and a very special and far-reaching and deep friendship links me to France, a very neighborly friendship. And it is therefore with all my recognition and gratitude that I welcome you here today. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the French Republic, Nicolas Sarkozy. Mesdames et Messieurs, Ladies and gentlemen, allow me, first of all, of course, to thank Professor Schwab and all those who've organized this Davos Forum for having invited me to make this opening speech at this 40th annual meeting of the World Economic Forum. Let me make things perfectly clear, ladies and gentlemen. I, has not, I have not come here as a political leader to teach anyone anything, but rather to say to you that all of us together must learn from the crisis. And why must we all of us together learn from the crisis? Well, because we are all of us together responsible for the crisis. And because, above all, we are responsible in the eyes of the world and vis-à-vis -vis the world we are going to leave our children. Ladies and gentlemen, without state intervention, everything would have imploded, total collapse. This is not a matter of liberalism, of state intervention, of socialism, of being from the left or from the right. It is a fact. And not 
to draw the lessons from what we experienced a year ago, namely that we need deep, profound change, means that were we not to change, we would quite simply be showing tremendous irresponsibility. This is not, this crisis is not just a global crisis. It is not a crisis in globalization. This crisis is a crisis of globalization. It is our vision of the world, which at a given moment in time revealed its failings. It is our vision of the world that we must therefore correct. There can be no prosperity without an efficient financial system, without free circulation, free circulation of goods, services and persons, without competition, which calls into question guaranteed high incomes. However, finance, laissez-faire, free trade and competition are only means towards an end. They are not ends in and of themselves. Let us not confuse the means and the end that objective that we must set ourselves. From the moment we accepted the idea that the market was always right, unconditionally so, unreservedly so, and un, in an unlimited fashion, and that no other opposing factor need be taken into account. From that moment on, globalization skidded out of control. Let's go back to the root of the problem. It was the imbalances in the world economy which fed the growth of global finance. Financial deregulation was introduced in order to be able to service the deficit of those who were consuming too much with the surpluses of those who were not consuming enough. The perpetuation and accrual of these imbalances was both the driving force and the consequence of financial globalization. In just the same way, I would say globalization first took the form of globalization of savings. In other words, it gave rise to a world in which everything was given to financial capital, everything, and almost nothing to labor in which the entrepreneur, mark my words, the entrepreneur gave way to the speculator, in which those who lived on unearned income left the workers far behind, in which the use of leverage, we've all heard this buzzword, the leverage, the leverage, that this use of leverage to an unreasonably disproportionate extent created a form of capitalism in which, it, in which taking risks, playing with other people's money, preferably other people's money, was the norm, thus making a fast buck, allowing quick and easy profits, but all too often without not only making the slightest effort, but without creating either prosperity or jobs. And all this for the s to make phenomenal sums of money. One of the most striking characteristics of this type of economy is, in my view, that within it, the present was all that mattered, and the future counted for nothing, all for the present or for the immediate here and now, nothing for the hereafter. And referring to what you were saying, Professor Schwab, the steady depreciation of the future could be inferred from the exorbitant demand for high yields in the present. Those yields inflated by leverage and speculation with the discount rate applied to future revenues. The higher they rose, the lower the values of the value of the, futures, of the future fell, all for the here and now. The same depreciation of the future could be seen in accounting practices, staggering accounting practices. Ladies and gentlemen, we actually reached a stage where we valued assets at the prices set by a marketplace, forgetting completely that this marketplace was fluctuating constantly to keep up with the surges and falls in share values. And when the markets were on a high, balance sheets were in the black and the very same artificially boosted figures would feed a new high on the stock markets. When confidence fell, the balance sheets would suffer as a result and bring share prices down. 
Now, we saw up close the damage done by that kind of accounting during the financial crisis when the collapse of the markets led to a collapse in the bank's capital reserves and further tightened the credit crunch. And we said, hang on a sec, the banks are not worth anything anymore, and therefore they can't loan, they can't lend money. Companies cannot ask for credit lines because they won't be given them, because the bank's value had simply gone up in smoke. Why? Because of the fluctuating, constantly fluctuating, hour by hour, minute by minute, day by day, values on the stock market. It is in our entire value system and our entire perception that was skewed. Now, the idea that the economic value of a company does not change from one second to another, nor every minute, nor every hour, and I'm sorry to say something so basic before such an august forum. To gain a clear idea of just how absurd that kind of accounting can be, we need only to think of the fact that in a market value system, a company in trouble can report a profit simply because it diminished credit rating has reduced the market value of its debts. It takes some ingenuity to think that one up. Our entire system of statistical assessment had been distorted, too. In the statistics, we noted the increase in revenues. However, in life, people saw wide the widening inequality gap. That's in real life what we saw. And in the statistics, the standard of living was rising. But meanwhile, the number of those feeling ever more keenly the hardships of life was also constantly increasing. Let us read again, read through the report from the commission led by Joseph Stiglitz. And let us wonder, ask ourselves questions about how we measure these things. Because that is tantamount to asking ourselves what our goals really are, what do we want to do with capitalism. I say this here, such reflections must not be the exclusive province of experts and statisticians. We have to leave behind us the culture of experts who talk only among themselves, each in their own field. We have to learn to think things through together, put our heads together. These are not simply technical issues. And we have to do so, because if we do not do so, we will be taking unforgivable risks vis-à-vis -vis the future. If we do not change banking regulations, if we do not change prudential rules, if we do not change accounting rules, and this is not simply a matter of experts, technique, expertise, if we don't do all of that, then where are we leading the sort of capitalism we want? What do we want? with this capitalism of ours. What are our ultimate goals? We're not, we will never put an end to hunger in the world if we do not succeed in stabilizing the prices of commodities, which are at present completely erratic. This is not an issue only for the experts. We will not save the future of our planet if we do not pay the true price of scarcity. That is not only an issue for the experts, it concerns us all. We will not reconcile our citizens to globalization and to capitalism if we are not capable of offsetting market forces with counterbalances and corrective measures. And ultimately, by discarding all our responsibilities in the marketplace, we have created an economy which has ended up running counter to the values on which it was nominally based. For instance, we've over-pooled ownership and risk and thereby have diluted responsibility. If risk is constantly pooled ad infinitum, then there's no one who ultimately bears the risk. By placing free trade above all else, what we have achieved is a weakening of democracy because citizens expect from democracies that it should protect them. By prioritizing short-term logic, we have paved the way for our entry into an epoch of scarcity. We have exhausted non-renewable resources, devastated the environment, caused global warming. Sustainable development cannot be achieved if profits up front and dividends for shareholders are our sole criteria. I'm not saying that these are illegitimate uh, objectives. I say that they cannot be the only objectives. Through excessive deregulation, what happened? Well, we witnessed dumping and no longer fair competition, in other words, and in other terms, unfair competition. We have let globalization be based on external growth, with everybody trying to grow by taking the businesses, the jobs, the market shares of others, instead 
of by working harder, by working more, by investing more, by increasing productivity and capacity for innovation. The globalization we had dreamt of at the outset was of the kind where instead of taking from others by means of monetary, social, fiscal or ecological dumping, each of us would found development on social progress, increased purchasing power, reduced inequality, improved standard of living. And look, the ILO, the IMF, the World Bank, the FAO, or the G20. At bottom, we are always talking about the self-same thing, seen from different points of view. The tremendous question we have to answer in the 21st century is how can we return the economy to the service of mankind? That is, ladies and gentlemen, the question that any leader must seek to answer. How can we act to ensure that the economy no longer appears as an end in itself, but as a means towards an end? How can we move towards globalization in which the development of each will assist the development of others? How can we build a more cooperative, less conflictual form of globalization? Because it is too conflictual right now. Let me be clear. Let us be clear about this. I want you to understand me. We are not asking ourselves what we will replace capitalism with, but what kind of capitalism we want. The crisis we are experiencing is not a crisis of capitalism. It is a crisis as a result of the skewing of capitalism. Capitalism has always been inseparable from a system of values, a conception of civilization, an idea of humankind. Purely financial capitalism is a distortion, and it treads roughshod over the very values of capitalism. But anti-capitalism is an even worse dead end. There is no solution in anti-capitalism. There is no alternative system to a market economy. But we can only save capitalism and a market economy by re-engineering it, dare I say this word, by restoring its moral dimension, giving it, restoring a conscience to it. Now, I know this expression will call, for, call forth many questions, but what do we need in the end? If we, it is not rules, principles, a governance that reflects shared values, and let me go further, what if we had embraced a common morality, common moral values. We cannot govern the world of the 21st century with the rules and principles of the 20th century. We cannot govern globalization while relegating half of humanity to the sidelines. We cannot take the decisions that are the result of globalization without India, Africa, or Latin America. That is sheer folly. We cannot look at the post-crisis world in the same way as the world before the crisis. Tomorrow's world will not be that of yesterday. Each of us must shoulder our burden of responsibility. There are unacceptable behaviors that will no longer be tolerated by public opinion, my dear friends, in any country, anywhere in the world, however powerful, however big. There are excessive profits that will no longer be accepted because they are without common measure. They are to the capacity to create wealth and jobs. Let us go a little further. There are remuneration packages that will no, no longer be tolerated because they bear no relationship to merit. Now, that those who create jobs, that those who create wealth may and should earn a lot of money is quite natural. There's nothing shocking about that. And this is a message we must get across. What is totally shocking is that he who earns a lot of money when things are going well considers that it's quite right and proper to continue to earn a lot of money when things are not going well. That is what is shocking. When the responsibilities are huge, then the remuneration must be commensurate. But that those who contribute to destroying jobs and wealth, but also learn, earn a lot of money, that is morally indefensible. In the future, and thank the two people who have applauded that latter comment, says the President. You know, there was a president 
I was um, the CEO of a major French bank whose resignation I called for because one member of his staff was able to embezzle that bank to the tune of several billion euros. And it is sim was simply unacceptable that that person remain in his post. Otherwise, what is all of this about? And uh, by one and the same token, I have defended the position of a major French industrialist who is now occupying a very important post because I think his salary is entirely justified and commensurate with his responsibilities. Likewise for the bonuses. Those who have, who have bonuses as a result of what they have enabled their company to earn, that's quite right and proper. But don't come and tell me that you can't make the difference between those who earn money for their company and those who lose money for their company. For their company. That's where we're no longer in a market economy system. That is where we are lying to people, and morally that is indefensible. And those who are acting thus, ladies and gentlemen, are quite simply destroying, destroying and undermining the market economy values that together we are here defending. It is a caricature. It is a negative of what we are defending. And there is a tiny minority which can skew in the eyes of international public opinion a system which has proven its worth. Now, in the future, there will be a much greater demand for income and revenue to better reflect social utility and merit. There will be a much greater demand for justice. There will be a much greater demand for protection. Now, Professor Schwab, I believe that we cannot escape this. We don't have a choice. Either we change of our own accord or change will be imposed upon us. By what? By whom? By economic crises, by social and political crises. If we decide to stand still, and our system will be simply swept away, and it will have been, it will have deserved to be swept away. Either we are capable, through cooperation, regulation, and governance, to respond to the demand for protection, justice, and fairness, or we will have protectionism, the closing of borders, isolationism, and each for his own. Now, I am in favour of free trade. But is there a single person who can actually say that public opinion will accept some countries shrugging off any rules in order to flood others' markets who those self-same countries have to respect and uphold certain rules? Protectionism is not at all what we are calling for. But that will be the result of this dis these dysfunctional methods. The G20 foreshadows the planetary governance of the 21st century. Without the G20, it would have been each to his own. Without it, it would not have been possible to regulate bonuses, to put an end to tax havens, and to change accounting rules and standards. However, here in Davos, I want to say one thing. It's all very well to take decisions, but these decisions must primarily be implemented. And I want to take this opportunity to say this. The signs of recovery that seem to herald the end of the global recession, yet this should not encourage us to be less bold. Rather, we have to be far bolder, far more daring in order to reform our systems of social protection, pensions, in order to combat tax fraud and invest to prepare for the future. If we do not do this, then this recovery will only be a respite. Now, of course, the commitments made must be implemented. We must stick to them. Let me take an ex give you an example. If the absolutely crucial debate on uncounting standards gets bogged down, if the private agencies to which we have delegated regulatory power deliberately flout the mandate given them by heads of state and government and we let them get away with it, what will be left of the credibility of the G20? And if there is nothing left of the G20 credibility, what are the prospects for world governance, negligible, and that would be catastrophic. If competition is skewed by prudential rules that remain very different from one country to another, from one continent to another, whereas we had decided precisely the opposite. For instance, we need to agree on a common definition of equity, and if we don't 
come to an understanding of what capital or equity means, then how can we be surprised that so many players consider it normal to return to the habits they had before the crisis? I don't believe that we can simply take symbolic decisions. We need, and I will demand that they be implemented, how can we conceive that in a competitive world we can insist that European banks have four times more capital to cover the risks of their market activities without demanding the same of American or Asian banks? Who could possibly understand that? It would be scandalous were we to do so, and we cannot accept that. How can we accept the obligation for banks to retain on their balance sheet a portion of their securitized loans if this obligation is not included in the regulation of G20 member countries, given that the principle was adopted by unanimous agreement? We cannot accept that. The difference being that, for instance, France will not say, well, I'm going to wait for others to do it and then I'll follow suit. No, we will spearhead it. We will stick to the letter of our rules, but we will be held accountable both in the eyes of world public opinion and make sure that others are as well and ensure that those who do not comply by these standards are forced to explain why they have done so to their public opinions. If we, decide, if we devise standards that do not draw the lessons of the crisis and that lead long-term investors to scale down the equity portfolios, which is staggering, then we must not be surprised that market prices become even more unstable and that a large number of companies find themselves even more threatened by speculative pressure. If what, if the lesson we learn from the crisis that we ask investors to invest less is that we've understood nothing from the crisis. Failing to do what we have decided to do would be an economic error, a political error, and I'd go so far as to say a moral error. Ultimately, we know perfectly well what we must do together. To do away with a system that has no more rules and that draws everyone down and replace it with rules that draws everyone up. Now, I know that as a Frenchman, I'm, it's a bit suspicious, you might say, to hear a Frenchman say such a thing. But we shouldn't have too many rules, admittedly, because that will draw down economic endeavor. But an absence, a total lack of rules, will do the exact opposite. It can't be that difficult to understand from one continent to another. Of course, this doesn't mean having the same labor legislation, labor laws everywhere. That would be senseless. But again, here in Davos, I was to put another question to you. How can we accept that some 50 member states of the ILO, members, members of the ILO, have not even yet ratified the eight conventions to defining the fundamental rights, labor rights. You see, frankly, I, I understand perfectly if a country that is not a member of the ILA should not be compelled to implement ILO conventions, but that's one thing, but if you are a member, but then you don't go and ratify or implement what you've agreed to, what credibility do you have? What kind of a system are we talking about? Is this regulated uh, globalization? Of course it is. It's a free-for-all. In Copenhagen, quantified commitments on climate change were made and subscribed to by 192 countries. How can we assure that these commitments are upheld without an international environmental organization that France has called for? How can we not see that the possibility of adopting a carbon tax at borders against environmental dumping would be a strong incentive for each country to respect the common rule. Now, the crucial advance in my mind would be to put environmental law, labor law, and health law on the same footing as trade law. Now, this would be a revolution in world regulation, and it would imply that specialized agencies and institutions are in a position to step in and intervene in international, in particular, trade disputes through preliminary questions to be decided before an action can be brought. The international community cannot continue to be schizophrenic because we are schizophrenic, ladies and gentlemen. We disown or, or we refuse to the WTO or the IMF what it is decided that we have agreed to at the ILO or the WHO. Oh, it's the same member states, it's the same leaders, it's the same governments. It, they are 
saying two different things according to whether at the WTO or the WHO, the IMF or the ILO. This is not how we are going to restore confidence. This is not how we're going to be up to our commitments. Of course, we have to help the poor countries. Of course, the issue of innovative financial mechanisms is a core question considering how much we have committed to budgetarily speaking, in order to stave off catastrophe. We are not going to escape uh, discussing some kind of taxation on speculation. And if we wish to restrain the frenzy of the financial markets, yes, we must finance development aid or bring the poor countries into the fight against climate change. And here let me say that I really support what Gordon Brown has been doing in Britain and calling for from Britain. Now, now, here I know I'm talking to an audience of great quality. Nonetheless, I have to put the question to you, ladies and gentlemen, what is the role of banks in the economy? And I've not said a dirty word. What does it mean to be a banker? I mean, let's come back to basics, the fundamentals. The job of a banker is not to speculate. It is to analyze credit risk. It is to assess the capacity of borrow borrowers to repay their loans, and it is to finance the growth of the economy. Now, if financial capitalism went so wrong, so badly wrong, it was, first and foremost, because some banks, many banks, were no, long do, no longer doing their job. Why take the risk of lending to entrepreneurs when it's so easy to earn money by speculating on the markets or on the stock exchange? Why lend only to those who can repay the loan when it is so easy to shift the risk off balance sheet? The very notion of off balance sheet is something which I have a hard time wrapping my mind around. And I have a lot of trouble accepting it. What now I finally have? In other words, why have rules? A good way of avoiding the rules is to take things off balance sheet. I agree with President Obama when he says that banks must be dissuaded from engaging in proprietary, proprietary speculation or financing speculative funds. Ladies and gentlemen, if we continue to perpetuate the imbalances that are the root cause of all of this, we will not get out of the crisis. Countries with trade surpluses must consume more and improve the living standards and social protection of their citizens. Countries with deficits must make an effort to consume a little less and repay their debts. Now, another touchy subject, currency. Are we allowed? You may say, can we even talk about currency? I say that we must talk about currency. I cannot understand that simply to mention currency is a problem. What sort of a problem? It's a problem to have not to be able to address an issue such, of such great importance. It is the principal issue at the heart of all of this. We cannot put finance in the economy back in order if we allow the persistent, the continuing disorder of our currencies. Exchange rate instability and the undervaluation of certain currencies militate against fair trade, militate against honest competition. Now, this is simply common sense, ladies and gentlemen. Employment and purchasing power constitute the adjustment variable for what I would call, forgive me for saying so, correcting monetary manipulations. The prosperity of the post-war era owed an immense amount to Bretton Woods, to its rules and to its institutions. Well, that is exactly what we need today. We need a new Breton world. We cannot have, on the one hand, a multipolar world, and on the other, a single benchmark currency across the globe. We cannot, on the one hand, preach free trade, and on the other, tolerate monetary dumping. France, which will chair the G8 and the G20 in 2011, will place the reform of the international monetary system on the agenda. It is a fascinating subject, and it is of crucial importance to all of the world's countries. And I very much hope that at Davos this is something you could discuss at your 41st session. Now, until then, we must manage prudently the adoption of measures to support activity and the withdrawal of the surplus liquidities injected during the crisis, my belief is that if 
we are too abrupt, we are likely to see a new implosion. We have to have a new growth model and models for the 21st century, a state model, the model for cities and towns, many others as well. You know, ladies and gentlemen, a matter of years ago, we would we were told this was the end of nations and the beginning of a new nomadic, nomadic era. But I wish to pay tribute to companies because we are rediscovering the fact that all of us have in common a nationality, a sense of belonging. No one seems to have lost exactly a sense of where they came from. And this applied to individuals, just as it applied to companies. And when companies, when the boat started rocking seriously last year, all the companies remembered very well, however global they were or international they were, where they came from. A few years ago, people were announcing the decline of organization, the end of companies. We wanted to apply to companies the principles of portfolio manager, management. We are rediscovering the fact that they are first and foremost human communities who, lead, who need a leader, an entrepreneur, a boss. They are living organizations who feed off their skills and their knowledge, their shared knowledge. They create wealth. They are living organizations, as I was saying, and they are not simply a means towards an end. They are an end in them of themselves and not simply by virtue of their share value. A few years ago, people were predicting that the city would spread, break up, and with its social cohesion, human relations and community relations. We are rediscovering the need for community, for urban cohesion. Ultimately, and basically, it looked as, it, as if citizenship would dissolve in the global market, but citizenship has found new springs in the ordeal of the crisis. And the tremendous lesson we have to learn is that in the world of tomorrow, we must again reckon with citizens in all of our countries. A citizen is not a separate category. It is each and every one of us. The company head, the shareholder, the employee, the trade unionist, trade unionist the non-profit activist, the policymaker, they're all citizens who have responsibilities towards others, towards their country, towards future generations and towards this planet of ours. Yes, yes, ladies and gentlemen, in the world of tomorrow, we must again reckon with citizens, with the demands of moral issues, the demands of responsibility, the demands of dignity for citizens. And I suggest, ladies and gentlemen, that we see this not as yet another problem, but as part of the solution. Not as to see the emergence of this new world citizen, not as an additional difficulty, but as something healthy and virtuous, something good, a piece of good news. And you know why? Because perhaps the emergence of this more realistic, more aware, more demanding world citizen will allow us to feel happier and more content with what we are and happier and more content with, with what we accomplish. Thank you. Thank you for your applause, especially those who did not stand up, because it shows those who have stood up. And it shows also the difference between the Anglo, or well, the fact that the Anglo differences between the Anglo-Saxons and the Continentals are beginning to disappear. And something that has really struck me is that when faced with major problems, we have all been standing on an equal footing. 
Professor Schwab, do not forget the World Fund, the Millennium Development Goals, and do not forget that we states will, of course, be there because we have committed to do so. But I know that a certain number of the world's benefactors, I'm thinking Bill Gates, will be coming tomorrow. But there's, don't forget here in Davos that there's a, the end to all of this, the ultimate objective, is human and has a human face. And I think a legitimate question is the distribution of wealth. Do not let yourself be hemmed in by caricatures because those who predict the end of the market economy would only be too happy. And I promise you I'm really going to leave the stage.